Welcome to the Entrepreneur Podcast, where we take a look inside the lives of the accomplished and successful businessmen and women. We'll get up close and personal with the founders of booming startups. So lean in and prepare to carry away something to skyrocket your own business. Please subscribe to our show and do leave us a review. It means a lot to us. Now, here's your host, Rajiv. Hey listeners, welcome to the Entrepreneur Talk Show. This is a show where we talk about entrepreneurship and speak to great founders, investors and startups. Today I'm really excited to have with us Douglas Abrams, founder and CEO of Xpara and Xpara IDM Ventures, Singapore's leading incubator fund. Uh, he has launched two seed stage uh, funds, Xpara IDM Ventures 1 and 2 and one early stage fund, Ex- Extreme Ventures in Singapore since 2007. He's also the managing director of Xpara Ventures Thailand and Malaysia and currently is the chairman of uh, Bansia or the Business Angel Network of Southeast Asia. Uh, originally from the US, uh, Douglas moved to Singapore way back in 2000. Uh, welcome, Douglas. Oh, thank you. Uh, just let me know first if there are any gaps in the intro and do let us know what's going on in your world today. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for the, the intro. I'll update a few of the points in sure. the intro. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and uh, we can use that to replace some of the information in the intro that's a little out of date. Okay. So I'm, ori- uh, I'm originally from the U.S. I, was, uh, uh, I went to UPenn undergrad. I went to Wharton for my MBA. I worked at J.P. Morgan on Wall Street for 14 years, uh, managing investment banking technology uh, for 10 years, and then global markets, internet products for four years before I left in 2000 uh, to come to Singapore. So I've been in Singapore since 2000 uh, when I launched my first uh, venture capital fund. Okay. This was uh, not an expire fund, but the first fund was a company called Parallax Capital Management. I launched with three partners, also from investment banking backgrounds, uh, and we ran a small hedge fund and did venture capital investing using the company's balance sheet. So this was the... Uh, my first experience with venture capital, and it was uh, in very exciting, challenging, rewarding, and I got uh, a bit with the venture capital bug and have been uh, doing that ever since. So I think uh, at this point, I'm probably one of the uh, longest lived in venture capital investors in Singapore and Southeast Asia, having been in the industry for going on 17 years now, which is pretty much the beginning of the venture capital industry in Southeast Asia. Oh, yes, definitely. Excellent. Yeah. And what got you from New York to Singapore? The weather. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. But, uh, I mean, definitely the weather in Singapore is, is great. It's hot year-round. But uh, in uh, the late 1990s, uh, 1998 and 1999, when my partners and I were looking at setting up uh, our business in uh we had come up with the idea to do alternative investment in Asia, and we uh, we hit on Singapore as the most likely entry point for a business uh, doing in that industry at that time. So uh, I think it was a good decision. You know, maybe we maybe we uh, didn't. I don't. I don't believe we anticipated exactly what was going to happen in the growth of venture capital in Singapore yeah. over the. So ensuing, you know, 15 years, but we picked, I believe, the right spot at the right time uh, to start a venture capital business. However, we were a little early, so I think 2000 was too early to launch a venture capital fund in Singapore yep. because uh, successful venture capital funds require an enterprise ecosystem, and the enterprise ecosystem really, uh, through several phases, but basically... Uh, I would say gelled in the current form around 2006. Mm-hmm. So, so there were some lean years between 2000 and 2006 on the venture capital side in Singapore, but since then it's been uh, exponential growth. Um, and that, uh, I always say when we're advising or talking to potential startup companies about identifying what markets to go into, we always I always advise they should enter. Uh, they should try to enter before the inflection point in the market because uh, in real life, we would like to enter, ideal case, we would like to enter exactly at the inflection point, Mm -hmm. which we're never going to be able to do because uh, there's an infinite number of points on the the line. Uh, We're always going to miss the ideal point 
either to the left or to the right, uh, meaning too early or too late. And I think uh, in our business, we need to be too early rather than too late because once we're too late, there's no more uh, exponential growth to, to take advantage of. If you can get in too early and make it to the inflection point, then you have a chance to to generate the type of returns that we're in the business for. Correct. So, yeah. Okay. So our, uh, I could sum up our strategy on timing is um, let's be early and uh, let's be uh, – uh, in, in that case, we're going to be too early sometimes, but uh, sometimes we'll be early enough uh, that we make it to the inflection point. Correct. And uh, let our listeners know a little more about uh, Bansia. Oh, so Bansi, I'm a, uh, I was a, joined Bansi as a director in 2002 and have been a director ever since. I was, uh, oh, I'm no longer chairman. I was chairman uh, until oh, okay. uh, from 20. I was chairman for two years, but I stepped down in 2015, uh, so I'm a past chairman. I was also previously a co-deputy chairman, but uh, I'm now back to being a regular director. So Vancy is the industry interest group for angel investors in Singapore and uh, promotes angel investing among both existing and new angel investors. Okay. Uh, so okay. and. Yeah, so uh, Bansi is the again. It's the was the first and I think leading angel investment group in mm-hmm. Singapore. So from Singapore now in Thailand and Malaysia, I mean, what do you think are the key differences in the startup ecosystems? Yeah. Um, so yeah, right now, so currently, Expira, we're in five countries. So we're in Singapore, we're in Thailand, we're in. Uh, Malaysia, we're in Vietnam, and we're in Japan. So we have, uh, oh. yeah, we're investing in all these countries, and we have offices and operations in each of them. So as you rightly pointed out, there are significant differences among the markets. Um, I think uh, I'll pick like uh, and compare a few of the markets. Uh, let's say I'll compare uh, Singapore. Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and Japan mm-hmm. in, in terms of what my view of the seed stage or early stage investment market. Okay. So I think uh, I would say Singapore is the most mature uh, of the seed stage markets in Southeast Asia. Okay. Uh, I think the ecosystem here is the most well-developed. Uh, there, are the, uh, there are incubators, accelerators, research institutes, uh, universities, uh, other institutions of higher learning with uh, entrepreneurship programs. There are seed stage, uh, early stage, Series A, and and later venture capital funds. There are active capital markets. There are corporate accelerators and incubators. So there, uh, there are entrepreneurs who have exited businesses that are helping companies right. to grow. So I think for Southeast Asia, Singapore is the most mature market uh, at the in the enterprise ecosystem. In Thailand, I think, is a fast emerging market in enterprise ecosystem. So okay. you notice that uh, you're probably aware that the Thai government recently announced a, a six or seven hundred U.S. million dollar incentive program for startups and venture capital funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. A whole range of uh, uh, incentives and regulatory uh, changes that are going to make it more uh, potentially easier for venture capital funds to invest in Thai startups and. I see, we see a tremendous amount of activity in the startup ecosystem in in Vietnam. Uh, sorry, in Thailand, and we're uh, really excited about that. Um, we have been in. Uh, I've been going to Thailand teaching since uh, 2007, and mm-hmm. I teach at Sasin, which is the business school Chulangan University Correct. in Bangkok. I teach venture capital there. Oh, by the way, I'm also teaching entrepreneurship at NUS, NUS. National, uh, National mm-hmm. University of Singapore for. 16 years, but uh, I think uh, uh, we're going to see tremendous growth in the Thai market. Um, Vietnam, I think, is a very exciting early, uh, super early stage market for enterprise ecosystem. And we just, uh, in uh, earlier this year, we finished our first accelerator program in, in Vietnam, which okay. was, it was called, uh, it's called CLAS Expira uh, uh, Vietnam Accelerator. We partnered with Microsoft on that accelerator, and we accelerated. Uh, we had nine companies enter the program. We graduated mm-hmm. seven, and 
we have already uh, issued term sheets to three of those companies. So I think there's, uh, which for a first time accelerator, it's a very high hit rate. Yeah. And we have just uh, we have just announced that we're launching batch two of the v- uh, Vietnam CLAS Expira Vietnam Accelerator Program uh, now. So we're soliciting uh, entries in the accelerator program mm-hmm. as we speak. Okay. Uh, Batch two, we're going to run in two cities in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, which was where batch one was located, and in Da Nang. So we're, we're really excited about the potentialities in Vietnam, and we encourage companies uh, to take a look at our uh, accelerator uh, sign-up page on Fundacity. Fundacity.com is where we, we uh, take applications to accelerator program and also uh, – uh, applications for investment from our venture fund. Okay. So I think uh, we're going to see hyper growth in the Vietnam market over the next uh, two to three years. Correct. And and in an interesting uh, sort of interesting twist, the uh, uh, I think the seed stage venture capital market in Japan is uh, at a very early stage of development, which oh, yeah. you, uh, which most people I think don't think about because we see the Japan market generally as more mature. Uh, within Southeast Asia, which I agree that it is uh, on the later stage venture capital side, but for let's say acceleration and seed stage venture capital, I think it's really at uh, early days there. So I see some real commonalities uh, across those those markets, all with uh, uh, fast growing seed stage investment sectors, but at different stages of development. Okay. So coming to the teaching part, I mean, I had that already. Is that how is teaching at NUS and Sassin? Is there a big difference in the mindset of the students uh, that we see between, let's say, Thailand and Singapore? So I think uh, it's not apples to apples for me because in uh, Singapore, I teach a an undergraduate course. I teach an MBA course okay. uh, and I teach a short uh, EMBA course. Right. In, in Sassin, I teach an MBA course and a, and a long EMBA course. So I think that main the only sort of um the only sort of class that i can compare apples to apples is my nus mba course and my sasin mba course now but my nus mba course is uh, is very uh international so although it's at nus in national university of singapore but we mm-hmm. have a very we have a very diverse student body so for example in my last mba class we had students from I had students from Japan, I had students from Europe, I have students from China, I have students from India, I have students some students from Singapore, but it's uh, so it's an incredibly diverse international class, so okay. it's it's not a, a, like a, I would say in a typical MBA class, maybe I have 20% Singaporeans and the uh, or 30% and 70 to 80% of the class is international students. Okay. So my Sassin MBA class, it's more, um, it's also diverse, but I think we have a higher percentage of Thai students. Um, I think, you know, the, I wouldn't say there's a, there's really like a cultural um, difference right. between Sassin and, and NUS. I think uh, the difference between, you know, classes is probably much greater than any sort of cultural difference between the two. Mm-hmm. I think the students in both, you know, both NUS and Sassin, they're, they're smart, they're hardworking, they're entrepreneurial, they're uh, really dedicated. And I think, of course, there's individual variation within each class. So some students are, are you know, highly motivated and some students are less highly yeah, motivated, yeah. But but I think yeah, I wouldn't say that there are clear cultural differences between the two schools. Okay. So could you uh, briefly describe the uh, Singapore or the Southeast Asia startup scene in the early 90s and fast forward it today? What do you think are the three biggest changes you've seen in the entire ecosystem over the past many years you've been here? Okay. Yeah, I wasn't, uh, wasn't here in the early 90s, mm-hmm. but I was here in the early aughts, you know, so I can compare there. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I would say the... The most important differences in Singapore from let's uh, I would I would actually uh, look at the Singapore startup scene as having gone through sort of three distinct periods um, and each of those periods uh, characterized by some uh, uh, 
uh, benchmarks that we can see the evolution. Mm-hmm. So the first period was the dot com boom and bust. So I would say that was from 2000 until 2003. Mm-hmm. This was characterized by a lot of uh, irrational exuberance about internet, uh, just like in the U.S. So we saw a lo- I saw a lot of let's say not a lot of uh, people who would like to be entrepreneurs rushing in to start companies mm-hmm. to capitalize on a perception on a perceived you know. Uh, ease of creating a successful startup that infected a lot of people back then. And then when the dot-com collapse happened, uh, irrational uh, rush out of startups. Uh, so basically we saw a lot of not not very sophisticated entrepreneurs, with some exceptions, but uh, you know everybody wanting to start a business and actually a lot of people wanting to start venture capital funds right. without really understanding how the business worked. Then from next period, like 2003 until 2007 or 2006 or seven, it was the, um, the valley, sort of valley of death for the startup ecosystem <laughs> where it, uh, there were uh, ex- exogenous economic conditions weren't that great. Um, and there was, a, I think, sort of a hangover from the dot-com bust. So there were uh, uh, not, but there was... A, in this sort of what I would call, you know, valley of death uh, period, yeah. there were the seeds of the entrepreneurial success being planted because there was a new generation of young entrepreneurs who were uh, getting an entrepreneurship education, uh, a lot of them at NUS, and were also uh, traveling to centers of entrepreneurial excellence, around, traveling and studying in entrepreneurial centers of excellence around the world, like mm-hmm. Silicon Valley. And then bringing back what they had learned you know, to Singapore. So I think okay. that was a period where we essentially grew the, the next generation of young entrepreneurs. And then 2007 until now, so the last 10 years, uh, which I believe were uh, in large part uh, catalyzed by Singapore government's National Research Foundation, oh, yes, which, yes. Uh, which, was, a, uh, which is, was and remains a highly visionary uh, organization at the prime minister's level in Singapore. Uh, that was put in place to stimulate the growth of the enterprise ecosystem in some key industry verticals and I believe has uh, catal- uh, played an uh, incredibly important role in catalyzing the growth of the ecosystem here. And so the, now the, that this phase, modern phase, has been characterized by much more sophisticated, well-trained uh, young entrepreneurs trying to, setting out to start uh, potentially scalable businesses and to uh, grow them to be world-class companies. Okay. And yeah, like uh, I think one of the different, you know, one thing we see like in modern Singapore, for example, uh, a project that we're working on now with uh, National Supercomputing Center. So National Supercomputing Center has just, uh, la- is just launching a supercomputer in Singapore that they are going to make available to any to uh, you know any young entrepreneur, researcher, scientist, or student in Singapore that wants to that has an idea to develop uh, an interesting uh, business idea that enable that can be enabled with the use of a supercomputer. Oh wow! So we are working with the National Supercomputing Center to uh, run what we call an innovation challenge and hackathon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's open to anybody in Singapore, any young entrepreneur, researcher, student, uh, science, you know, budding scientist in Singapore that wants to propose an interesting business problem to be solved on a supercomputer will be, uh, they can go to the website, which is nsccpackathon.com, and they can uh, apply to enter this competition. And then selected people will be able to actually enter, a, will be sent to a a two-day hackathon where they will be able to run their idea on a further developed idea on a real supercomputer. Okay. So, okay. so I think you know, this is something we can't imagine that you know, would have been happening in Singapore oh, yes, uh, 10 years ago, but yeah. it's something that happens okay. on a regular basis these days. Okay. So are the recent, uh, I mean, not recent, but over the past, I think, two years, the big, big investments and valuations justified? I mean, corrections are already happening, but do you think this further correction that's going to happen? Hmm. So, you mean in the U.S. or 
And And overall, Nisha actually, I mean, we're seeing it a lot in India now. Yeah. So for me, like, okay, so first first off, I I try not to make predictions about about macroeconomic or economic uh, events or conditions because I don't believe that I have any expertise or insight that enables me to do that. And so I stay away from predicting what's going to happen in markets. But uh, one thing I can say from my own experience, I think uh, one of the benefits that we have in Southeast Asia versus some other venture markets in Asia, like you just mentioned, India, maybe China. Yeah. We, we have avoided, I think, the excesses of uh, valuation that have characterized some of the larger markets. Um, most of our investments are still very realistically you know, priced uh, relative to okay. some of the larger markets. So I think uh, I, definitely I hear what you're saying and I have uh, I understand people that follow these markets believe that there's a, a overpricing and that uh, it's possible that there's going to be a correction I think if that happens Southeast Asia will be much less affected by this correction than some okay. other venture capital markets okay so what would you say is your most successful investment till date so our most successful investment to date is the is a company called 2C2P. Oh yeah, payments, yep. So yeah, this is the um, Southeast Asia's leading provider of e-commerce and m-commerce payment solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, the company began uh, in Thailand and now we're in every country in Southeast Asia and some countries in North Asia. And we're processing more than uh, over a billion dollars worth of transactions per year. We have raised uh, through Series C venture capital round in 2015, mm-hmm. and we're looking at a potential Series D raise in, in 2016. Um, and we have gone from a handful of people in the back in late 2007, 2008 to uh, 100 people in the company now. And wow. uh, yeah, so it's uh, uh, and we have a full range of products. So products from uh, all the way from credit card payment processing systems for banks and large merchants to um, to products that let people without uh, without a credit card purchase online and a whole range of other uh, solutions. So uh, this is definitely our most successful investment to date. This was in Fund One. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, so Expire Idea Ventures. Okay. Um, in in Fund Two, which is Expire Idea Ventures Two. I would say our most successful investment is a company called CoAssets. CoAssets, oh, okay. Yeah, this is a company that does real estate equity crowdfunding. And the comp- we invested in that company in 2014. The company listed last year on the NSX, which is the second board in Australia. Yep. But uh, we are in the midst of uh, relisting the company on the ASX, which is uh, expected to happen uh, sometime in the next couple months. So okay. if if that uh, goes through successfully, then that'll be our most successful company in fund too. Okay. So I've interviewed uh, Sam from Styland and also Don from Tam Bay. Very dynamic founders. I think we know a lot about all aspects of the business. So what do you think are the typical criteria that you as an investor is looking at in a startup when you're investing at different levels, say at T- Seed or at Series A? Like is it team, market opportunity or everything together? So we look at... Um, we look at what's the company's product, what is the what's innovative about it, what's the customer pain that they're addressing, how big is the market opportunity, how fast is it growing, what's their strategy to capture that market, um, and what is the uh, financial offer and plan that they have around that. So mm-hmm. those are the the typical factors that we look at on the one on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we look at the team. So especially when we do seed stage investment, we invest, uh, I personally invest heavily on the basis of the team and my perception of the, the quality of the team. So I usually say like the top three factors for us in, in considering investment are team, team, and team. Okay. Like, yeah, like uh, location, location, location. But, uh, um, you know, a little humorously, but also at some level uh, very seriously, because I know there's some debate in the uh, industry about which is more important, team or product market fit. <laughs> Correct. But, but I actually think this is a little misdirected because I believe that it is team that creates product market fit. So I think product market fit is not something that happens by itself. It's something that is developed by a strong team yep, yep. And, and executed by a strong team. 
Uh, so, uh, and actually the example you gave, so those are two companies that we invested in. Um, and uh, Sam is a former, the CEO of Style Hunt is a former student of mine from Sasin. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And actually the 2C2P founder, Mr. Ong, is also a former student of mine from Sasin. So these are both entrepreneurs that I've known for almost, I mean, now have known for 10 years. So I think uh, that's uh, some, uh, I would, you know, there's no assurances in this business that that's going to, that one factor is going to create success, but I believe this is as close as we get to okay. you know, an assurance. Okay. So what would you define as success for you as an investor? So, so success for us as an investor is when we are able to sell one of our investments for 20 to 30 times the valuation at which we invested. 30x, okay. Yeah, because that's, the, that's based on our strategy and our cost of capital. That means that we're generating the required return for our investors. So every time we do that, then I believe that we have succeeded, made a successful investment. Let's say a startup raises too much money, regardless of the valuation, more than it needs. Is that a good thing? I mean, the way that that question is phrased is definitely not a good thing, right? <laughs> I, I would say uh, it's always when, okay, I ask this question when I talk, you know, because I also do training workshops and for entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. investors. And I mean, one of the questions I always ask is, what is the right amount of money to raise? Is it as much as I possibly can? Uh, is it... Uh, as little as I possibly can, or is it just enough? And I think, of course, the answer is just enough. Now, that means if I raise too much, that was not correct choice. And the reason is why? Because I'm not being given this money. I am acquiring this money by selling my equity. My equity is a fixed uh, quantity, and I want to. And it's a fixed quantity uh, that uh, you know. One way I like to think about it is imagine. Your 100% of equity is 100 ounces of gold that you have, and you have a strong view that gold is going to increase in price Correct. over the next five to 10 years. You wouldn't sell it all right now at the, you know, whatever offer you got. You would try to sell just enough to maintain your cash, uh, cash flow and uh, be able to profit from rising value. So I think, uh, of course, saying that you should sell, raise just enough money, it's also not easy to figure out you <laughs> yeah. know what is just enough but yeah. uh, of course this is one of the challenges we have as entrepreneurs and investors figuring out what is enough so i think uh, we want to raise enough to comfortably get to our next funding round or cash flow positive so mm -hmm. if we if we can do that then then we raise the right amount of money okay. but if i had to if i had to err again as an entrepreneur i would raise a little more rather than a little less because one thing we're sure about in our business is that the future is uncertain. And an uncertain future, it's better to have a little more money than a little less money. Always, correct. What's your take on IoT? I mean, the whole IoT buzz that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think IoT is very exciting. Um, I think we're looking at IoT as one of our sectors of okay. interest. And I think there's a lot of exciting companies and products in that space and definitely it's a space that we're watching and interested to invest in okay uh your view single founder versus a team what do you prefer oh it has to be a team okay yeah because we only since i mentioned before team is the most important thing and then if i have one person it's by definition not a team <laughs> okay so uh, yeah i think uh, we'll only okay. we'll only consider investing in okay. a company with more than okay. one founder and uh could you share with us what do you think uh, is some of the best pivots taken by a startup that you know? Some of the best pivots taken by a startup that I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, okay, okay, one of our, I think my my favorite pivot to date is a company uh, that's called Wander App. This is another company that this is a company that we invested in in Fund Two. Okay, it, it was one of our first investments in Fund Two, and this company is founded by uh, an entrepreneur named Crystal Chu. Mm -hmm. Another another example for me of how important the team is because uh, if you uh, when you get to know the history of this company, you'll see how how dynamic she is and how she has steered yep. the, comp the company through several uh, pivots to get to the place where she is now. So originally, when we first invested in this company, it was uh, called Zip Trip and the the concept was to 
uh, create a travel travel app that uh, enabled people to get the best deal on travel that they didn't have a clear idea of the date and location for. So her idea was it's very easy to, it's sort of easy to get the best deal if you know, for example, you're flying to Bangkok next week and you just want to know what's the cheapest airfare. But, okay. what if, but what if you don't really know? You, know, you have an idea like I want to, uh, um, I would, let's say December, I want to go somewhere, but I don't exactly know where, but I would like to get, you know, I know what, sort of what I want to do and I would like to get the best deal on that. So she, that was a first idea. It, uh, she developed that business. Uh, uh, um, it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, mostly related to economics of the travel industry. So she then pivoted uh, that idea to a second uh, app, which was um, a, a matching app for single travelers. Okay. So let's say I'm a, somebody who's single and I want to travel, but I don't want to travel by myself. The idea was you could use the app to match uh, single travelers who were interested to go to the same place and and maybe and also with similar uh, ideas about what they wanted to do there or similar uh, personalities. Um, and then so that was pivot one. And then uh, this also, uh, I think after a while, she felt that this was too small of a market. Uh, then she did the second pivot, which is the I think the real winning pivot, which is the one that underlies the current product where she went uh, and pivoted this product so that it's now an app for, um, for people to uh, uh, people of like interest to meet and chat in, oh, okay. in the interest groups. So the idea is uh, instead of one-on-one meeting and chatting, like all the other chat apps, this is a sort of a, a interest based chat where people will go in and enter a, a chat where that's focused on a particular uh, subculture or subcategory or interest. Like for example, let's say you're interested in food. So when you go into the app, instead of swiping left and right on people's faces or anything like that, you see a list of interests. Like for example, okay. you, you know, maybe you see if, uh, if you're interested in food, you can click on a food group and then you can go in and chat with other people who want to talk about food. Or if you're Singapore expat, you can go in and Singapore expat group and mm-hmm. chat with people that are Singapore expats. So I think it's a, a multi, uh, multi-user uh, and a very interesting new new spin on that idea. Okay. But I think it's a great example of a company that has gone through two pivots to get from a, what was originally a good idea to what I think is a great idea. Yep. Yep. So, for, I mean, a question that most of our listeners ask is, how do you evaluate a business plan? I mean, any key like trust areas that you look at? So, uh, trust? Uh, I mean... No, like key areas that you look at, trust areas. Oh, key areas? Yeah. So... Yeah, like uh, I look at the what's I think the factors that I mentioned before. So right. what's what's the innovation? What's the customer pain? How big is the market? How fast is it growing? What's the strategy to enter and own that initial market niche, and then to defend the position? And uh, who is the team that's going to do this? How are they going to do it? And that's all on the company side. And then on the financial side, uh, how much money do they need to execute the plan? What's a business model? Uh, what type of financial results can we expect if it's successful and what's the exit strategy and what type of return would we get if it all went well? Okay. And what do you think are the most important things a startup founder should be looking at when selecting a co-founder or looking for a co-founder rather? I think a uh, co-founder, you, would, uh, you want somebody with a complementary skill set and experience to, to yours and you want somebody who is... Uh, uh, a good fit for you, meaning that somebody that you're going to want to want to and going to be able to work with uh, over the next five to ten years to make this company a success, and of course somebody that you can trust and somebody that uh, will share your vision for the company and somebody that uh, you're going to want to uh, not not going to be unhappy when if things go really badly and mm-hmm. you have to you know, go and break the news to the. <laughs> this person and you want to yeah. feel like they're going to kind of support you when things go, you know, when things inevitably go wrong. And there's so many incubators and uh, angel investors now. So what do you suggest to a founder who's looking out for, let's say raising money, what's the right kind of angel or incubator they should be looking for? So, I mean, I would broaden that to say what type of investor, you know, how should you choose investors for your startup? Correct. Um, and I would say, 
building on the previous point, you should choose the investor for your startup as carefully as you choose co-founders. And in some, sometimes I say to choose your investor as carefully or more carefully than you choose your spouse, because once you are uh, invested with an equity investor, it's almost impossible to get out of that relationship. So, yeah, so it's not just about the money. I mean, it shouldn't be just about the money. Of course, you know, money and financial terms are important, but uh, economic terms are important, uh, and you want to get a good deal on those. But you need to look beyond that and say, is this an investor that shares my vision for the business and the company? And again, that somebody that I'm going to be comfortable working with for the next five to 10 years under very diff- it can be very difficult conditions, very stressful yeah, conditions. Yeah. And uh, make sure that that investor is somebody that I would say somebody you would be comfortable to add to the management team because the, in many cases they might be a director, which is not exactly like being on the management team, but it's a very close relationship. Correct. So MVP, yes or no? I think it depends on the industry. Okay. So uh, mobile app, definitely yes. Medical device, probably no. <laughs> yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, it, I would say it's uh, it's sector specific and then product specific. Okay. Finally, new uh, uh, non investment topic. So, uh, what's the best advice that you have received? The best advice that I've ever received. Uh-huh. Mm, oh, wow, I have received a lot of good advice. So, uh, um, it's hard to pick one best piece of advice. But okay, one one. Uh, piece of advice that has stuck with me over many years in my career is um, if like with, when things are going really badly in your business, think about, did anybody die? <laughs> okay. Uh, and if, if nobody, if the answer is no, then it helps with perspective. Things could be a lot worse. Correct. And finally, Douglas, any last thought or piece of advice that you may have missed you want to give our aspiring founders? So the, yeah, the, Probably single most important piece of advice I would give to aspiring founders is uh, two pieces is, and they're, they're related, think big and take risk. Don't be afraid to take more risk. So think as big as you possibly can. Um, you're going to spend many, many hours and days, months, and years of your life on this startup. Uh, and therefore, you should try to generate the maximum return from that investment of your time, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, do something that's meaningful. Uh, do a startup that's meaningful for you because that's what's going to keep you going uh, over the long haul, and that's what's going to make the success really the sweetest. And take more risk. So however much risk you're taking now, take more. All right. Again, Douglas, thanks for taking the time to talk to us and inspiring our listeners to start their own ventures and all the very best uh, for at Expara. You're welcome. And uh, oh, just oh, I know one thing. I just wanted to mention. Yes, sure. we are we are currently on our uh, uh, third Expara fund. So it wasn't in the bio, but we're now uh, investing Expara Ventures three. So oh, we are. Okay. Yeah. So we're investing in five countries, and we are looking at seed stage investments now. So don't uh, startups should not hesitate to contact us for seed stage investment. Again, they can. Log on to our Fundacity mm-hmm. page and look okay. at Expire Ventures 3 and can apply for investment from us. All right. Again, uh, visit us at theasianentrepreneur.com and visit the uh, Expire team at fundacity.com and also uh, leave a review on your thoughts about the show. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to the show so you don't miss an episode. Our hope is that you are encouraged by what you've heard and you can put these same concepts and mindsets to use with your own style. See you next time as we discover more about what it takes to be an accomplished entrepreneur. In the meantime, head over to theasianentrepreneur.com and check out show notes and other information to motivate you in your entrepreneurial endeavors.